Hi everyone, I'm Russ Still, and welcome to this Gold Seal Mock Check Ride session. This will be an instrument pilot oral exam. It's going to last roughly between an hour and an hour and a half. In this exam, you're going to see a real applicant hash it out with a real examiner. These two men will be sitting across the table from each other, digging into weather planning, decision making, routing changes, and maybe even a few odd Paul instrument approaches. For all intents and purposes, this will be an authentic representation of what your own upcoming check ride might look like. So, let's get started by introducing you to our pilots. Alex Hernandez, our applicant, is based here in Atlanta, and he's one of our Gold Seal students, so you better do good, Alex. <laughs> our examiner, as always, is our longtime friend, Todd Shellnut. So, Todd, this is just one more of many. You've got all the paperwork done. You guys are ready to go. So, I'm going to exit stage left, leave it to you. Thank you very much, Russ. This ought to be a great night. Uh, we're going to have fun here. I'm going to go over kind of like some little ground rules for you. I know that you've taken a check ride before, but I'm going to brief you exactly about how we're doing this tonight. Um, I will be using uh, this stack of papers over here that's referred to as a plan of action. And this is what a DPE uses when they go through a check ride. And it's basically a series of predetermined scenarios and trigger events that kind of help us um, make our way through the airman certification standards. I'll also be sharing some of the airman certification standards here on our screen, helpful screen in the back here. We'll also be able to see your flight plan and other things as well. So when we talk about it, we'll just both look over here at the screen and I'll ask you questions about your route and other things that you'll see here on the screen. Sounds good. Um, I will be writing some things with my fancy pen uh, as we're going through here. And so don't worry about what I'm writing. It's just because, like Russ said, we're going to be together for about an hour, hour and a half. And I want to be able to give you a thorough debrief after this is all over with. So with doing that, I've got to make sure I keep proper notes throughout the ride. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much. And if you don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and begin. Awesome. No questions yet. As, that's wonderful. Okay. So first off, uh, we're, uh, we'll just go um, kind of in line with the ACS. Uh, we don't have to actually go like uh, area of operation one, two, three, four, uh, like that. It can just be uh, as long as I cover everything by the very end. But we'll start off talking about your uh, pilot currency as an instrument pilot, okay? So just like you had to maintain currency as a private pilot, we're going to talk about this as an instrument pilot. So I, uh, before this, we talked about do you have an append, some paper, be able to write things down as an examiner talks to you about some things. So here's some dates and some information for you. Uh, you received your instrument rating today in 2021. And it's today, 2023. And uh, uh, since you received your rating, you've flown five approaches. And you've tracked the nav aid seven times and you've held twice. Can you act as PIC in IFR under IMC? And if not, what must you do in order to act as PIC? So I could not do that um, <clears throat> due to the fact that I need six approaches. Um, I need... So the example you gave me is all I've done, I'm assuming. Um, I need to do six holds within six months, and this is two years, so I'm not exactly sure when these uh, approaches were done, but within six months I need to do six approaches, or six instrument approaches. Uh, I need to intercept uh, and track, hold, and uh, use navigational electronic equipment. Very good. In regards to you going out and flying and doing everything that you're going to do, flying instrument approaches and holds and stuff, tell me how you document your experience as a pilot. I have a logbook. I, I put everything on, in a logbook. I actually have two logbooks. I use the one uh, on my, on my iPad, and then I also use one on a physical one. Okay. Um, in regards to that, what do, you just, do you just write down the time, or what do you add in the remarks section? So in the remarks, I will input that it was exactly that those in reference to those what we call six hits i'm sure you've heard that before sure. <laughs> um so i try to put it so uh just for example flying over here in northeast georgia i'd say i flew the ils into uh five or in runway five for gainesville so i'd put kgvl ils five and then i'll put cth for circle of, or uh, i'm sorry uh, ctls for circle of land um and i that's kind of how i how i log everything good outstanding so uh before we started uh, we talked about the airplane that you're flying and you're currently flying a, a newer model a g1000 172 that is equipped with the the gfc 700 autopilot um so you were scheduled to fly this airplane for a flight 
Uh, but when you show up, the only plane that they have available is one that has a, a six-pack and a GTN 650 GPS with a CDI. Um, you've never flown this airplane before. Would you take this airplane into IFR? I would not. Uh, personally, I would not. Um, I have flown six packs before, but I've not not IFR. Or I I have done them IFR, but not not enough. I have much more proficiency in a G one thousand. That is on my to do list, though, to to get proficient on six packs in case that was to ever happen. If I really needed to fly and I didn't have uh, the G one thousand. Sure. Tell me about some of the risk that you would have to mitigate uh, for, for a pilot who did choose to do something like that. So, could you rephrase the question? I yeah, <laughs> why is it risky to do something like that? The instrument scan, I feel like, is integral in, uh, in on an IFR flight. You really need to be consistently having a, a I don't want to say perfect, but a near perfect scan. Um, and when you have a traditional sh- six pack, you know, if you do it, Consistently, you you can do the way that you uh, scan might be a certain way. If you have a shotgun, you know, uh, layout, then you'll be able. To, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, I'm not really sure where the attitude indicator is in comparison sure. to the altitude uh, or altimeter. So I would. I that that's probably the the main my main uh, reason to be apprehensive about it. Okay. Um, on the day of your flight, you show up and you notice that the G1000 database is actually. Uh, out of date. Uh, could you still go fly IFR? I could not. Okay. Um, you're planning an, an IFR flight and you check the weather the night before and you find that the forecast shows that the, the weather the next morning is supposed to be a hundred uh, a thousand and three, meaning a thousand foot ceilings and three statue miles at the arrival. Uh, then you check the next morning prior to your takeoff and find that the destination weather is now 500 foot ceilings and two statute miles. You've flown just a couple hours in about the last five to six months, uh, but you are current. Would you conduct this flight? Personally, no. I mean, why? Um, FAA has those quote unquote currency requirements, um, but I feel proficiency is is huge. Um, I eventually I'll get better with my personal minimums and be able to push them a little bit further um, once I'm more comfortable. But as of right now, my personal minimums are, are pretty uh, conservative. Um, I wouldn't fly, for example, I wouldn't fly single pilot IFR period right now, but um, I wouldn't fly uh, single pilot IFR in, in, in tough IMC, you know, you know, th- thick layers where it's not going to be like I, I can break out way before uh, minimums. Um, but yeah, the flying with lack of what I would call proficiency, even even though I'm current, would, is just uh, asking for, for trouble. Okay. All right, let's move on into talking about weather. Uh, tell me, what weather source did you use to plan for our make-believe flight? 1-800-WX-BRIEF that I called. Okay, excellent. I love to be able to hear that pilots actually still do that. That's still a wonderful thing. I love to be able to have a little bit more feedback than just looking at a screen, ask people questions. I just love that aspect of it. Yes. Um, Why do you choose to use that service? So ForeFlight gives me a a good weather briefing here, um, and I know many of my friend uh, pilots use that, but I am not as trained as that individual is, right? If uh, if I wanted to learn how to cook something and I had, you know, a professional chef near me, I would ask him how to do it. Um, I'm not going to rely on myself to do, to look over whether uh, data interpolated into whatever I believe is, is uh, the way to read it. I would like to ask somebody, hey, is this, um, so how, like, my entire route is going to be IMC, or um, could you tell me? I know that my route is 257 miles. I don't only want to know what it is at PDK or what it is at Jacksonville. I'd like to know what it is, you know, in Macon or uh, in Dublin, and just consistently going down so I know exactly where or how the weather is going to be out throughout my flight, not just depar- departure and arrival. Okay, outstanding. Um, besides. For flight and calling a weather briefer, what other sources of weather uh, products can you get and places you can get stuff? Uh, 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM is, an, is a website that is uh, commonly used. Um, 
uh, aviation weather I cannot remember the website I'm uh, I use a certain oh, one thing and it's kind of sure. like what, what, I, what I'm used to if you were about a week out from planning an IFR flight where would you start about a week out looking at the weather I'm not sure Oh, I couldn't tell you where. Um, a week out, I uh, I'd be looking at uh, just weather.com uh, for radar, looking at the radar, seeing what, what what's what's around. If you know there's a hurricane coming or anything. Sure. sure. Well, that's right. I, I agree that those are some good resources. Even a week out, that would be a good thing. Uh, when you did say you called and got a briefer, right? Yes, sir. What type of weather briefing did you ask for when you called? So I asked for an outlook, um, and then I called back and I uh, referenced my outlook, and he gave me a kind of a, a deeper, more in-depth uh, look into my uh, my flight plan. Okay. And um, if how long out? When when is the outlook uh, kind of made to be used for? Like how many hours out prior to your flight? If I'm not mistaken, it's twelve hours. Okay, about half of that. Six hours. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, well, that's good. Well, that's just a very good way to get started and get a very thorough pre-flight. Uh, today, we, we planned a, a flight from Peachtree to Cab Airport down to uh, Craigfield in Jacksonville, Florida. So that's the, what we'll look at here. We'll look at the routes in here in just a second. And uh, in the interim, what we'll do is we'll just start off with um, um, a few basic weather reports. Uh, and then we're going to look and see, uh, just based off what I show you, uh, the reason for is because currently right now it's extreme clear Yes. Uh, to our destination. So we're going to look at some things that are not okay. as maybe as nice. So we're going to assume that these weather reports are actually from uh, those particular areas and we're going to go from there. So without further ado, what we'll do is we'll pick up the, um, there we go, thank you very much. And we'll look at some of the weathers here. So we'll go to a place here that may not have some some good weather. So I'm just going to put this particular METAR in. And I'll blow this up for us just a little bit. And if you would, uh, identify for me the weather report that you're seeing here at the top for Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, Tupelo, Mississippi. I couldn't couldn't tell you that that's where that's from. I've never seen T U P before. No worries. Um, so you are asking what type, me to, of, what type of weather report? Uh, METAR. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, if you would just go ahead and read that to me until you get to the A O two in the report. Okay, I see. Um, so seventh day of the month, uh, thirty zero. 036 Zulu. Um, winds are going to be 350 to 21 knots, gusting 26. Seven statute mile visibility, thunderstorms and rain, few clouds, uh, 12, 1,200, and scattered 4,500, broken 100. Uh, temperature 23, 2.21, and altimeter is going to be 29 or 9 or 5. Remark Alpha Zero Two. What does Alpha Zero Two mean? Uh, it's a a type a type of something. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about to, we'll come back with it in just a minute? Maybe okay. maybe you read it again. Um, if you could do me just one favor and just reread the clouds one more time for me, please. Okay. The ceilings of the clouds. Few at. Uh, 12, 1,200 scattered okay. at 4,500 and broken at 10,000. Okay, very good, very good. Um, we have another report down here at the bottom, which is, what is this report called? That's the TAF. Okay. Uh, so if you would, right after the KTUP, if you'll start with the date stamp and go from there. So from the sixth day of the month, uh, 2334 Zulu, uh, 07 on the day, on the, for, on the seventh month, uh, from zero 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 Zulu to zero on the seventh month, twenty four hundred Zulu. Uh, winds are going to be variable at five knots, uh, more than six statute mile of visibility. Uh, in the vicinity, there's going to be thunderstorms, scattered three thousand, uh, cumulonimbus, and broken ten thousand. Temporary. You going to keep going? Yeah. Okay. 
uh, temporarily uh, from zero zero to zero two hundred. It's going to be variable winds fifteen gusting thirty. Ooh, uh, two statue mile visibility. Thunderstorms with rain broken uh, at three thousand five hundred cumulonimbus. For, from keep going. Uh, no, I tell okay. you what. About what time do you think that the weather may start clearing up on us? Looks like coming in uh, at zero four hundred. Okay. So what is the weather supposed to be there at zero four? Five statue miles. I mean, this it's, could be a little bit better after you clear up, as in like extreme clear is looking like it's going to start at eleven hundred. Okay. Um, but it, it's getting better and better throughout the TAF. Very well. Uh, so tell me, uh, from your experience and your uh, planning and everything, um, how would you feel about departing at this current time? So this is a, uh, from the, the current date stamp on the METAR. If you were departing at that time, how would you feel about the weather? I would not like to depart during that time. Can you tell me what is in this weather report it has you saying, I don't want to do this? Almost all of it. No. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, thunderstorm, rain, uh, thunderstorm in the vicinity is scary enough. Uh, cumulonimbus clouds, uh, 15 gusting 30, and it's variable, so it's not even like you can kind of assume or not, you know, just, oh, let's put some, you know, left, let's adjust for the left crosswind. It's going to be coming from every angle. I don't know. It's just too much. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some of these hazards. Okay. Um, thunderstorms. What is it? How does a thunderstorm form? Uh, it's an uprising force. Um, <clears throat> I'm drawing a blank. I apologize. It's no problem. Um, you know, it's an uplifting force or an uprising force. Uh, heavy or low pressure and high pressure mixing uh that's kind of where i'm at right now i apologize are they more prone to happen in maybe dry air or moist air moist air okay all right so maybe does that help a little bit so <laughs> i mean just thinking of like seventh grade math or seventh grade uh science of how you know evaporate water evaporates and okay. c condensates into a cloud and then once it's full it rains down okay. um, but i couldn't have for some reason i can't and i obviously studied this and i can't think of why or how a thunderstorm is actually made no worries uh would you say that moisture uh, high moisture content is one of the factors yes okay. Can you tell me some different ways that moisture is actually added to the atmosphere? Through evaporation and condensation would be one of them. Um, being, you know, the dew or brought in from from the the sea. That's different uh, reasons as to how, but I couldn't pinpoint exact re or ways. Sure, no worries. Um, well, let's talk about a little bit about, instead of talking about the formula of the thunderstorm, let's talk a little bit about the life of a thunderstorm. Does it go through some stages? Tell me about the life of a thunderstorm. It does. It has its developing stage, its uh, mature stage, and its dissipating stage, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Could you just look at a cloud and tell if it was uh, a thunderstorm going through the dissipating stage? It would start kind of... I don't know how do you say this, like coming upon itself. Uh, I don't know how to how to <laughs> explain yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it, it would become smaller. I guess would be a, a elementary way of okay. saying it. Okay. Okay. Well, you know that was one of the uh, the things that you had there was uh, the thunderstorms were concerned to you. I know you also were talking about gusty winds. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about wind and how that affects a, a pilot while they're flying. Um, what are some concerns for a pilot when we're talking about winds when we're planning a flight? Uh, you can talk as much as you want about winds and every aspect that you want. Just open up to me about okay. the winds. So the f start of it all is the takeoff roll um, and obviously the taxi. Um, but uh, 
as long as you're kind of adjusting for the while you're taxiing at low speeds is a, a lot less risky than when you're actually on a takeoff roll at full power. Um, but you don't want to be, you know, pushed off the runway or uh, getting pushed to the right or left too much while you're while you're taking off. You know, the runway is the safest environment. You know, you get pushed into a tower or something due to crazy strong winds wouldn't wouldn't be a great day. Um, that's where I would begin. Uh, it would continue on along your flight. If you have a strong headwind, you're going to be mu much slower over the ground, which is going to cause, uh, could possibly cause fuel um, issues. You know, you, you, you planned on flying at 100 knots. You have a, just for uh, example stake, or a 50 knot headwind. You know, now you're going to be traveling roughly around 50 knots over the ground, um, and you you planned for minimum fuel at, at your arrival, and now you're going to be possibly hitting zero fuel before you arrive. So there would be some uh, wind concerns that I would be looking at. Okay. Um, when you're coming into land and the wind is uh, really, really bad and makes your airspeed all fluctuate, what is that called? So when you're coming into land and you have uh, winds and your airspeed fluctuating, mm -hmm. uh, an unstable approach, I guess would. Well, uh, let's see. Let me ask you another question, and may I may actually give you the answer a little bit. I don't mean to, but let's just let's let's do this. Um, have you ever flown through wind shear? I have not. Okay. How would you identify if you were flying an airplane through wind shear? Uh, you're going to be losing airspeed, gaining airspeed, losing lift, gaining lift. Okay. So if you were on approach and you saw your airspeed fluctuating, what could you probably deduce? That there's wind shear in the area. Okay. Probably bouncing around a little bit. Too, yes. Right? Okay. Um, what are some dangers with, of wind shear? Um, it's a very, very strong down force of wind that could... Um, almost push you directly into the ground uh, without you wanting wanting that and you're also uh, when you're on when you're in an approach or you're trying to approach uh, the runway environment you want to you want everything to be stable you're looking as you're doing your instrument scan you're looking at your airspeed and your uh, altitude and all that good stuff and you end up seeing that you're at 65 knots and out of nowhere you're at 40 knots um, it's Due to, I don't want to say no fault of your own, but kind of no fault of your own, right? You you, you get wind shear and, and and it causes a very unstable approach, and just that's what I would okay. really be worried about. Okay. Um, one of the other things that you pointed out in those weather reports was the clouds. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about clouds here, in just a second. Now, clouds come in different families. Yes. Okay. If you were flying along and you're flying through a um, a cloud that has continuous precipitation and the winds are relatively calm. What normally type of cloud is that that you're flying through? Mm. I wish I refreshed myself on clouds before I came. And I'll here give today. you another hint. Um, you're, before you descended into them, it was just a flat sheet top. At a very bottom's just kind of dark and gray underneath it. Very. The tops are at 5,000. It's clear above. Not lenticular. Is that what you're looking Where would you find lenticular clouds then? Since you're saying it's not lenticular. Maybe it is lenticular. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, th mm, I don't want to dig, dig a hole for myself here, but I was thinking lenticular clouds were kind of in mountain mountainous area. Lenticular clouds would be in a you are correct when you say that so uh, this would not be in a mountainous area okay yeah so there's different clouds have different properties do you know about the different families of clouds all i could tell you about right now is lenticular cirrus and cumulus or cumulonimbus clouds and stratus tell me about clouds. cumulus clouds how about that uh, let's do that let's start from that start from that direction tell me about cumulus clouds cumulus clouds are uh Though I like to explain the ones that kids draw, you know, they're like the the, the big poofy little marshmallow looking clouds, yep. um, and they're thick. Uh, t tend to be like when you're going through them, it's just like, well, I guess I'd say that the only cloud I've ever flown through was a cumulus cloud. Okay. Um, 
so it was just thick, a little bumpy, uh, nothing too crazy. Um, but it, yeah, it's just very thick. As soon as you go in, it's like somebody just puts a white blanket sh over over your glare shield. So clouds have been said to be the signpost in the sky. They can just kind of tell us a little bit about the atmosphere and what's going on. Um, in private, you learned about stable and unstable atmospheres. Tell me about the atmosphere that would probably be present around a cumulus cloud. So, man, I'm not there right now. Um, so, you could always ask, ask me to rephrase the question if you need to. Yes, that would that would help. I think hopefully. Rephrase the question? Yes, please. Okay. Tell me about the characteristics of an unstable atmosphere. An unstable atmosphere is going to have really good visibility, um, and it's going to be a little less, or a little bit more bumpy, a more bumpy of a ride than a, than a stable atmosphere. Okay. Anything else? An un, you asked unstable, right, I think? Yes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's, that's when... Um, Thunderstorms are starting to be made. Okay. Tell me about a stable atmosphere. Bad visibility. Um, smooth ride. Uh, and usually clear besides the visibility. Okay. All right. So there's this weather stuff. Man, we could just really go really hot and heavy deep in this weather stuff, couldn't we? Yes, and hopefully Absolutely. we don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least at the very end of this, we'll know exactly what we need to work on. Maybe yes, that would be help. That, that's okay. definitely. Now, you know, it's very important that when we're looking at these things, we always want to look at, you know, we look at so many different things. But in essence, uh, the, the weather reports basically have just this, the bare bones basics. It's basically what the weather balloon sends out. You have the wind direction. You have temperature a moisture content, just a couple of bare bones things, uh, dew point, things like that. Um, when you planned, let's look at uh, your flight plan that you put together here for this flight. And let's look at the winds and temps that you uh, had for yours. So can you tell me how you derived those particular winds and temperatures? And we're looking at this box right there. Awesome. Yeah. So I actually uh, pulled a lot of that information from uh, for a flight and went and asked when I was talking to the weather briefer, I was asking if those are the that, that is what I should be expecting. Um, and he gave me uh, basically the same on the second page. Uh, it kind of shows what uh, he told me as well. Um, but I, I pulled some of them off of for flight uh, on, on in the nav log there and also verified with the weather briefer. OK, very good. How often? Does these winds and temps um, a law forecast? How often do they come out? Ugh, I do not know. Okay, no worries. We can come back to it if we have time. Okay. In regards to the weather that you looked at when you briefed this, can you tell me? Did you have to choose an alternate? I did not have to choose an alternate. No. Okay. Let's look at your flight plan here that you've put together okay. for us. It'll probably be the page two of the flight plan. And here we can see that this particular box, this, uh, this flight plan down here, it has 17 different boxes on it. And uh, I noticed that in their box 13, which is, by the way, it's the only box that's different between the VFR and the IFR flight plan. Um, I noticed you put not applicable. So yes. tell me what made you put NA in that box. So from what I'm tracking, the one you need, alternates it's when the within before or after an hour it, there's going to be uh f lower than 1000 foot ceilings uh 2000 i'm sorry 2000 foot ceilings three statute miles i apologize for that 2000 foot ceilings 2000 feet above ground level ceilings and uh three statute miles of visibility. Anything below that, and you would need to list an alternate. All right. Moving on to the next page. We have moved on to the second page here. That is good. We're just moving right through the plan of action. Um, there are, of course, we know that uh, there's different hazards when we're flying as well. What are some of the 
hazards that pilots just don't like to get involved in on a flight? Uh, Some weather hazards. Could you, I don't know, if rephrasing the question, elaborate more on the question? Sure. Uh, do you like flying through turbulence? I do not like flying through turbulence. Okay. Can we identify that that's probably something that pilots don't like to fly through? That would be something. That what people... else do pilots not like to fly through? I mean, I would say that clouds, if you can avoid flying through the clouds. So right, IFR that, conditions. IFR conditions. Okay. Yes, I would say that was another good one. What else would you think? Uh, when a pilot's flying along may start to scare you if it starts to accumulate on your plane. Ice. Icing. So we don't like to fly through icing as well, Definitely right? Definitely not. Do we have weather reports that kind of tells us about these things? We do. Okay. Tell me a little bit about these weather reports, the names and the conditions that they forecast. So air met sigmets and convective sigmets, I think is what you're yep. pointing towards. Um, air mets are... Uh, <clears throat> Reports that that ass, uh, assist pilots, typically G GA pilots, general aviation pilots, small aircraft, single engine, sometimes um, multi-engine uh, piston aircraft. That, that it, could, it could affect them, you know, due to uh, light turbulence or moderate turbulence. That's not going to uh, in a that would affect a, a a small plane's flight compared to SIGMET's going to affect. Airliners and then convective sigmets will uh, basically put a ground stop on on and, and everybody. Like a for example, a hurricane would be a convective sigmet. Okay. Very good. Um, let's look a uh, circle the wagon around here. Back to this other thing here, just a second. Yes, sir. Um, is your airplane equipped with weather radar? It is equipped with ra weather radar. Okay. Um, is, there any, is there any good, what are some good, good things, bad things about that? It's, it's not exactly real time. It doesn't, uh, you know, if out of nowhere it starts raining right in front of me, it's not going to show rain popping up on my, uh, on my uh, actually, for, for example, today I was flying and it showed that we were flying through rain and it was clear. So that rain must have been there, you know, several minutes ago. Uh, while we were flying, so that, that that's one of the negatives. You don't want to rely on 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 that mm -hmm. weather radar to to you know, skirt by right. uh, IMC or anything. Paint me a paint me a, a bad situation in which that would really get you in trouble. You see uh, some thunderstorms coming in, and <clears throat> you're kind of like calculating. Oh, you know what? I'll definitely make it there before that the hurricane comes because I'm seeing that the hurricane you know moving a lot slower than we are. Um, well, that hurricane, or not hurricane, I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep saying hurricane, uh, obviously, because we just had it's one okay. recently. Uh, it's all mock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do the hurricane uh, if you like. <laughs> so, the hurricane that's coming, uh, you want to try to try to beat it there, um, but no, you, you, you don't want to, to do that because there's... It, it's there's a delay, right? Or you want to try? You, you're trying to veer left and try to try to make this, make, make sure that you're you're not going to hit that that hurricane or bad weather could be on top of you, and you 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 thought it, while you're looking at the radar, it's showing that it's still a few miles away. Okay, good. Um, let's uh, we've talked enough about weather. There's definitely more we could dig into, but let's go on to the next thing so we can kind of get on through here as quickly as possible today. Um, let's look at some. Um, some systems related to IFR. So probably one of the most important things that we have to rely on as pilots is everything working. If anything breaks while we're in flight, we have to go down on a reduced load, right? And reduced and partial is not good in IFR. Um, does your airplane have any systems that are related to icing, either anti-ice or de-ice? So the pitot heat could be considered uh anti-ice it if it were to ice over you could turn the pitot heat on and it could melt melt that out of there um it is fuel injected so it's not going to have any carb heat like i'm used to when i did my private uh um but i think that's that's all the icing that that my okay. aircraft has so when you're um if you were flying through icing or freezing rain or something uh do you have a some type of in, in front of the cessna does it have like an air filter below the spinner it does. Okay. What if that spinner was to become saturated and freeze over? How would the engine get air? Hmm. 
So if the intake is completely iced and it, yeah. I'm not sure how it could get air. Okay. Besides we'll definitely make a note of that. We'll talk about that later. All right. Yeah, you're talking about just engine air, not alternate yeah. or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, just engine air. Okay. Um, cause, and the only reason why I asked that is because you brought up the, um, because it didn't have carb heat. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's, that's just a spinoff question of that. Okay. So how would you recognize that you did have, so now let's go back to the original question. How, how would you recognize that you did have pedo icing or some type of obscurement to the pedo tube? So your airspeed indicator would uh, be out of whack or be out, okay. of, out, of, out of normal usage. Now, your standby instruments that you have in the year model that you're flying, is it the G5 standby or is it the regular, the regular. air instruments at the bottom? Yes, okay. Sir. So what would you see on your G1000? What type of indication on your airspeed indicator there? It would show, so... And you may have just said it. Just repeat it. So the the air my my airspeed indicator not working normally. So um, for example, if it was to be uh, frozen, it could it could it could show zero when I'm actually moving uh, at a okay. certain speed, or it could lock at a certain speed before. Would your standby also show zero? It would. Okay. Um, I have seen in some of these G one thousands though that uh, when the sometimes the airspeed indicator may have a red X through it. Mm. Is that the same of as a pedo failure, or what is that? I don't think that's the same as a pedo uh, failure because uh, p practicing partial panel, if we're pulling the AHARS uh, circuit breaker, it, we, I still have my pedo heat, but I or about pedo heat and my uh, ASI there, my standby ASI compared to the red X over my um, airspeed indicator okay. on my G1000. Okay, very good. Um, are you familiar with what the manufacturer? Uh, what the manufacturer of your aircraft says what you should do if you become, if you should get into icing conditions? I do not. I'm not aware. Okay. Uh, since we're on the pedo tube and we're, let's go ahead and start talking about the pedo and static system. So if you would explain that system to me and how each one of those devices work and you can Either explain to me from the standby, or you can explain to me from the G1000. Whichever one you decide to, I'll just spot check the other one. Okay. All right. So um, the static tube, the, stat the static hole, the static port um, is looking for stagnant, or is measuring kind of the stagnant air in the atmosphere. And then the pitot tube is uh, receiving ram air, the, the air that's being pushed into it um, due to movement. And that it, it and that that's kind of how how uh, it's comparing your uh, airspeed. That's how, that's why the pedal uh, tube is important for the airspeed. Um, and then your altimeter and your VSI are just going off of your your the, the static boards. Okay. Um, I read in the POH. It's, did you did you just tell me something about an air data computer? Is that what you said? Did you talk about an air data computer? I don't think I did. What is that? The ADC is uh, how the G1000s receive uh, the data. That's um, uh, do those things ever go bad? They do. What type of indication would you get on your G1000 if the air data computer was to go bad? A red X. Okay. On <clears throat> what devices? Um, the, I'll close my eyes and picture it really quick. Um, the ASI, the um, attitude indicator and the VSI as well as the altimeter. Okay. All right, good. What kind of effects does icing have on your airplane if you were to accumulate like, uh, let's just say, rhyme icing? You would increase drag as well as weight, technically. Um, yeah, increase drag, which would uh, decrease lift. Okay. Not bad. Pretty bad. What could happen if you let it build up? Uh, you could just fall right out of the sky, right? You, you, you lose aerodynamics. Be more specific. Don't say fall out of the sky. Be more specific. What would happen aerodynamically? You could stall. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to scare any of the viewers. It's kind of hard for an airplane to fall right out of the sky. That's true. Now, That's a helicopter. True. Yes. Now, that thing, I want to tell you. But I, I digress. I digress. 
Okay. <clears throat> um, so we've talked about all those that we want to talk about. Let's move on to the next one. Um, does your airplane have a vacuum pump? It does not. All right. How is the attitude indicator and the directional gyro, how is that powered? Uh, ele electrically, electronically, I'm not sure what the correct word is. Okay. Tell me how that works. Um, it has consistently spinning gyro. The, the, the gyro scopes are consistently spinning um, through electricity, I guess. Okay. Let's um, let's wrap this back around. Um, we're, we're talking about the instruments here. Let's let's stop talking about the systems per se. Let's step up to an, just another level of that. Uh, what aircraft instruments and systems before an IFR flight are you going to be checking to make sure that they are, are working prior to accomplishing an IFR flight? So, what instruments will I be checking before I'm go on an IFR flight? I mean, I want to make sure that my altimeter is good, my airspeed indicator. Uh, I mean, I want, there's not an instrument that I wouldn't want to be so working. Let's, let's go around the patch. Let's go around the the block there on the on your G1000. You're looking at uh, pick one, pick any one of them. Okay, airspeed indicator. How do you know that's working? On the ground? Yeah. So it would read zero. Uh, okay. That would be that, that Keep one. going. Walk me through the whole thing. Go to altimeter. Tell okay. me about the altimeter. So my, my altimeter, uh, when I read, I hear the ATIS or the AWOS or ASOS, uh, the weather, uh, it's going to give me a uh, altimeter setting. I'll put the altimeter uh, setting in, into the little window, and then it'll give me the altitude, uh, the field altitude, field elevation, um, plus or minus 75 feet. Um, I would want the turn slip in, indicators need, needs to be moving when you're when, when you're taxiing. You know, little S turns while you're taxiing, which should be moving back and forth. Uh, you want to see you want to see the uh, horizon is is straight and level. Um, yeah, okay. and your uh, compass and your <coughs> excuse me HSI are uh, matching as well. Does the airplane have a mag compass? Yes, it does. What would you check on that? I would make sure that it's not cracked um, or tilted or leaning or anything, and it still has a little liquid in the inside, and it's uh, reading the right. When I'm, when I'm facing north, it'll say north on it. Okay. So besides the pedo static system, that sounds like an important system, vacuum system or whatever, the gyro system, that sounds like an important system. What other oh, I'm systems? I'm so sorry. I earlier said it doesn't have vacuum, and it definitely does have vacuum because I, one of my on the run up, it asked me to check the vacuum system. So okay, the, okay, good recovery. Thank you. Good recovery. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, no um, <laughs> let's let's get on to where I am now. That way, I don't lose track of thought here. Um, so besides checking the the instruments for the airplane, um, we also have to make sure this airplane's airworthy. For IFR flight. Now, what goes into airworthy for an IFR? And let's just go ahead and bump it up a little bit for you. An IFR night flight. Okay, so uh, usual VF VFR needs um, plus uh, the special IF. So the usual IFR needs being the A tomato flames and the a AV8s. Uh, acronym, I was looking for that word, acronym, plus the new acronym for IFR flight of grab card. Um, and unfortunately, I need to write it down, but generator, alternator, um, a radio, a altimeter, a um, the ball for the turn slip coordinator, um, the, sorry, the C, um, D is a directional, uh, so basically just your your heading indicator or your HSI um, uh, Attitude indicator obviously you would definitely need that um, I cannot think of the C for some reason I'll clock okay very good um, you, you said altimeter. Yes, sir. 
But it seems to me like the altimeter also appears in a tomato flames. It does. Like Why is it in both of them? Um, it needs to be... Oh, man, I can't think of why. Um, picturing when I was studying the small little parentheses next to the one in grab card. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and I... The window, maybe if the 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 barometric window that allows you to adjust it. Okay, okay. Do you know what that's? What the word that parentheses word is? Have you figured it out yet? Can you can you picture it? How about we table that when you figure out the word while okay. you're sitting here thinking about the ten thousand other things I'm asking you. Yes. Can, <laughs> you can remember that word for me, okay? How do you determine that the GPS is airworthy? All of the, um, when you turn it on, it ha gives you, uh, the MFD on the right tells you, uh, the dates of, of all the databases. And this, uh, all the databases must say expires at a future date from today. Okay. Is this GPS WAS? The one that capable? I use, yes, it is. Yeah. What is that? Some special, uh, specification that this GPS has that allows you to go down to uh, certain minimums that uh, was a uh, non was enabled uh, aircraft would not allow you to. Okay. Uh, is that like always working? Is it something that can fail? Or? It is something that can fail. Okay. How would that affect you if it failed? You would have to change your minimums uh, when you're, you know, picking your minimums from uh, your approach chart. I'll give you, you know, LPV minimums or just regular LNAV VNAV minimums or just LNAV minimums. Okay. Let's say that while you're flying along, we're going to come back to the vacuum system just a little bit, but we're not going to, we're going to take an alternate route on the vacuum system. Um, the vacuum system's failed. When anything fails in the airplane, what's one of the first things that you have to do as a pilot? Let, especially if you're an IFR. Let ATC IMC. know. Let ATC know. Okay. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about what you would do if that would happen. But before we do it, I want to know, besides telling them that something has failed, what other things would you be required to report to ATC without a specific request? This is a very long acronym. Okay. Thank you, time. Marvelous VFR C500. Um, missed approach. Uh, so when you're going missed, that's something that you need to tell um atc um when you're uh changing your altitude when you're on a vfr on top um clearance uh reaching a holding fix <clears throat> Okay, uh, sorry, this uh, is an ETA, the ETA changing plus or minus three minutes, um, leaving an approach, or leaving a holding fix, I think I said reaching an approaching fix a second ago, um, unforecasted weather is something that you would need to tell uh, uh, ATC. Uh, vacating an altitude, uh, safety of flight, uh, radio or navigational uh, issues, outer marker, uh, when you're reaching the outer marker, uh, final, when you're reaching the final approach fix, uh, the compulsory uh, re reporting points, and then not being able to climb or descend 500 feet per minute. Okay. That is a very extensive long list that it you is. just read to me. And I, I, I've always wondered about how uh, pilots would prepare for a check ride, and they learn all this stuff, right? Um, how do you plan on, as a pilot, making sure this stuff doesn't fall by the wayside and making sure that you understand what to do while you're actually flying an IFR? So, like you said, um, this whole acronym is kind of a way to prepare for check rides or when somebody asks you, 
Um, but you're not sitting there flying thinking, is this something I need to tell uh, uh, ATC? Is this something I need to tell ATC? It's kind of like while you're being trained, you end up doing it so often, right? Like, for example, every single time that I fly, I go missed. I say, hey, I'm, uh, I just went missed. And that's not because I think, oh, do I need to tell ATC about this? It's kind of just like ingrained into you while, while, while you're flying. I mean, and a lot of them are kind of uh, self-explanatory. You, you'd rather tell them too much than tell them too little. Mm. A lot of acronyms we have in aviation, right? Yes. Absolutely. But it's even easier with the Gold Seal IFR Know-It-All. It can be found on the Gold Seal website. Check it out. All right, back to us. That was a plug from a buddy. Let's look at this. Uh, the pitot tube. Let's go back to that. I want to make sure I cover that one last time. Pitot tube becomes blocked in the front. Does it have another hole in the back? It does. The drain. What if that whole hole. entire thing becomes frozen? What kind of indications would you get? So your airspeed indicator would uh, confusingly it would move. It would still move. It would just it would still change, um, which I think is. Uh, not more dangerous, but mentally, it kind of like make, make, makes you feel a certain way because it moves with your altitude, right? So if you gain altitude, it starts going higher, and if you lower altitude, or if you, sorry, descend, yeah, uh, it goes down. So what if you didn't climb or descend? What if you were maintaining 5,000? Or whatever altitude, substitute an altitude. Probably. It would freeze at, at, what it's, at what it's at. It wouldn't move. Yeah. So bottom line is, if you just stayed steady in flight, you wouldn't know anything, right? No, you would not know anything. Oh, that's scary. That is scary. Okay. Just threw that in there for you. Okay, very good. Um, one last thing here. Uh, we talked about the magnetic compass. Um, you are on a heading of west. Your vacuum system is failed. Okay. ATC requests that you turn 90 degrees to the left to a heading of south. So you're on west. You're turning left to a heading of south. Tell me how you do that in an airplane, partial panel, and you're doing it strictly by the mag compass. So you would obviously go from W to the S on the magnetic compass, um, but you need to do that at a standard rate. Um, when you're IFR, so you would, uh, a full turn is two minutes, a half turn is a minute, so it would take you about 30 seconds. Try to kind of time 30 seconds, or take 30 seconds to make that left turn. Hmm, interesting. Who told you to do time? Who told me? Yeah, did you figure that out on your own? Did your flight instructor tell you that? Yes, uh, Russell still told me that on the gold seal. Uh, wow, uh, what a school. smart guy. <laughs> He's a um, pretty cool guy. It seems like turning to headings on those magnetic compasses can be quite difficult sometimes, right? It is. It is. Can you tell me, why is it difficult to use that compass to turn? It has uh, errors uh, themselves or built in, inherent errors, I guess you could call them. Okay. So let's talk about one of them. Okay. Uh, tell me about this one. It has an acronym that goes associated with it. If you don't know the acronym, I have a couple. Uh, one of them is UNOS or OSUN, whichever yes. one you want to use. Tell me about that. What is that and how does that affect you? Uh, so you need to undershoot north and overshoot south. Uh, that's how the UNOS. Um, it will affect you because when you're turning, so if, I, if, I, if I'm turning south, right, I need to overshoot south. So if I was going to... Uh, like you said in your example, I was flying west. And I needed to turn left south, um, so I would turn left to instead of one eight zero, I would turn left to one six zero. Um, because by the time that I level back out, it'll kind of lag back to one eight zero. Very good. Um, time turns are a lifesaver. Yes, I can tell you that hundred percent. Uh, trying to turn to these particular headings and looking at that is can be very dis, dis. I've had partial panel in the airplane for real, and I can tell you it's mm. it's not a good thing to be in. Okay, um, I would like to come back here and look at your uh, IFR flight plan sheet on the big screen here for us, and we're going to talk a little bit about this and why you chose your route, how you planned your route, why you chose the altitude, different type things like this. 
Uh, of course, this is the uh, the very rough draft here yes. um, of it. Uh, let's look at page two and see what we can see on page two. Now, on page two is the, the flight plan, and we have that particular one. I think you had a third page as well. Uh, let's look at the third page for the flight plan. And if you would, um, I'm very curious about some of these numbers up here that you have, because there is, seems to be a tremendously large amount of numbers over there. Uh, I'm not sure how well we'll be able to see this uh, for the folks at home. I don't know if we can expand on on just this top column right here. Um, so tell me, what does all these numbers mean? You can just go over one or two lines, but walk me through it and tell me uh, what that means. And then we're going to talk about why you planned your route the way you did. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> just going to the third line, because it has uh, a lot of information in according to the first line that has kind of missing stuff. So DCT meaning direct. So I'd be flying direct to the Macon VOR um, on a heading of 166, which would be a course of 161. Um, I chose 5,000 as my altitude as I'm flying east. Um, and I, so I need to stay at the odd thousands. Um, and then the Aroka was uh, 46 or 47. I can't remember off the top of my head. I want to say it was 47. Um, so I wanted to stay above the Aroka. Um, the direction uh, and speed of that's talking about the wind two six three at zero one one. Um, the temperature of plus one six. Um, speed in is my speed in true airspeed of one one zero with a ground speed of one one two. Uh, distance is going to be seven zero miles. A seven zero mile leg remaining is going to be 178 and then the, the time that it would take on that leg would be 37 seconds th sorry 37 minutes okay very good uh so there is just a lot of information that we have on here um i want to talk a little bit about i know everybody nowadays wants to do the digital planning like the digital planning is the hottest thing it's the, the new hotness um but Something that kind of uh, confuses me, and I want to get your point of view on it, and we'll talk about it is as for pre-flight planning. Um, with the with the old style flight planning chart, and we'll, we will go back here in just a second. For right now, we'll just look at this, but we'll go back two screens to the flight plan, and we'll look at that. Um, which one of these do you plan on actually having in the airplane with you? Do you plan on having that first one we looked at that you hand wrote? Or are you going to have something like this in the airplane with you? I would like the one that I hand wrote. And can you tell me why? The simplest reason is like you were saying that viewers at home are going to have a trouble reading this, right? Because there's so much data put into, like you just have to, you'd have to zoom in to look in, right? And, and when you're flying IFR, you don't want to be like, what does that say there? You know, you, right. so right. It, it's much bigger, the other one. Um, and I am, when I learn, I, I, I don't learn by reading, I learn by doing. Sure. And that's why, so when I actually wrote it down, it helped me. Uh, you got a good point. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the first picture there. And what are some things on this that you are actually doing in flight? So, for example, 5,000 feet, that means when I'm going to be uh, reaching 5,000 feet. And that's why I wrote 5,000 feet is kind of like my, my reminder. And then the... To, uh, the two under that is descend, right? Uh, kind of just tells you to descend mm -hmm. in, in, in flight. Is that, is that kind of what well, you're I, I see there's, on the right-hand side, I see there's boxes that hasn't been filled in. And I'm kind of curious about those boxes that haven't been filled in. Yep, so those are uh, actual. So uh, every, everything that is filled in is estimated, and everything that has not been filled in is actual. Mm -hmm. So wh while you're flying, you would throw that in there, throw that information in there. You ever done that? I have. Okay, good. Um, why should a pilot fill in actual? Uh, because not ha this having or not the reason you wouldn't need this navigation log. I could start there is because you have a lot of all that stuff on your computer, you know, in your, on your uh, flight computer in front of you, or or in your GPS, and so. But if your GPS were to go out, it's pretty easy to be lost. Um, if you're flying in a uh, what's it called? Familiar area. You can yeah. kind of look. Oh, you know, there's the Mall of Georgia. I'm, 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 I know where I'm at, more sure. or less. But when you're an IFR or you're not, you're an IMC, you don't know where you are. But timing where you are, or timing when you left, and and seeing that 
Um, I left at 2130. Um, and then it's been eight minutes. Where am I? Oh, I should be roughly around 5,000 feet. You know, I'm going to continue down for 35 minutes and I will, I should be reaching the Macon VOR and I continue down for an hour and 37 and I should start my descent. And it's, it just kind of ke keeps you sure. uh, situationally aware of where you are in an emergency situation where your GPS goes out. Okay. You gave me a big, long, lengthy acronym a minute ago. Yes, sir. It had something in that acronym concerning time. Yes. What was it? ETA. ETA what? What is the numbers that follow that? Plus or minus three minutes. Okay. So using just the G1000 on board or using the formulated flight plan in that's, that's four flight spits out, how do I know if my ETA is plus or minus three minutes? So what do you... So can you ask it, I guess, one more time, just repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. And then this is, if I'll reword it if I need to, but, okay. to, but I'm, I'm trying to get something very specific. We have numbers, we have boxes that says actual. Yes. We don't have that on G1000. Correct. It just shows total time elapsed. Yes. Uh, we're supposed to have a clock. Yep. Okay. It was also, and then you another acronym that you gave me tonight, of all the acronyms you gave me tonight. Um, how do we know as a pilot that we are plus or minus three minutes in our route? Not on the, not using this? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, let's just say that you were using this, right? Okay. And this is, I think this is the same thing as your last, uh, the one that you did in four flight, right? It's the same yes, points? Yes. So how would I know that I arrived at 5,000 on time? Because you would look at the time that you, or you would look at, you know, your altimeter and say, oh, look, I'm at 5,000. What time is it? It is 2140. Oh, right. it took me two minutes longer than I was expecting to, to okay. get up here. So it does the, this one has a place for you to write it in, right? It does. If I had it digitally on four flight, what are my options to record the time that I arrived at those destinations? I don't know if there is a spot to put that. There probably is, but I don't know it. Okay. Something to think about as an IFR pilot. Definitely. Uh, because you have to comply with yes, those. That's, that's a regulatory thing. I have a knee board uh, for that, but I don't know if there's anything on, uh, on four flight, and I, and I would like to learn if there is. Things that make you go, hmm. Yeah, things that make you go, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see that you have your fuel in here that you're burning about 7.2 gallons per hour. Yes. And you have your other fuel flow that you have. Um, about how much fuel do you plan, plan on having on board when you land at Craig? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that on th that. I thought I did, but I don't. Uh, maybe I did not save Is that one. Is it on one. your four flight one? I don't think so, but I could just add all that up really quick. Yeah, go ahead and add it up real quick. Like, let me see what it is. Okay. And then we'll do a couple more questions here and move on to a different category after we just burn this cross-country flight planning portion to the ground. Awesome. So we'd have about 31 gallons of fuel still in, 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 the, in the plane. Okay. What does the reg say that about fuel requirement? You need to have uh, an hour of fuel left. Okay. Is that what it says? It says one hour? Or is that your personal minimum? That's my per personal minimum. It's 45 minutes. I, th mm. I should know this. So is it fly to your destination, land, have 45 minutes? No. Okay. What is it? It's... Fly to your destination, then go to your all alternate and have 45 minutes on top of that. Okay. So the fuel required that you, undoubtedly, you, you must have a, a, a specific amount of fuel on board the airplane when you, when you did, and you have fuel projected burn. Does this fuel burn that you have calculated, does it take into, a thing, take into account things like taxi and run up and fly in a unforecasted SID that they gave you and climbing to altitude and flying a star that wasn't filed and a 
fly in an approach, a full approach. It does not have that. How would you as a pilot account for those unseen things? So I, not that this would, um, I, like, so for example, when I was doing my, uh, just calculating all that, that 1.9, I made it two, that 4.2, I made it five, that 11.7, I made it 12. And then that 0.5, I made it just to sure. calculate more fuel burn than is, than is actually happening. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, I would have to time anytime that, that, that there was a, uh, deviation to my, my my original flight plan i would need to start timing to make sure that i'm burning 7.2 which i would uh say eight hours of fuel okay so this time thing is pretty important it huh? is absolutely okay so it's sometimes nice to have a bunch of digital stuff in front of you yes but it's imperative that you have a knee board and it's imperative that you make notes of things absolutely uh because Sometimes just looking at a number and saying 20 minutes until we get to our destination is just not enough. Yes. Very good. Tell me, how do you file an IFR flight plan, please? How do I personally do how it? How do you personally do it? On for flight. What other ways are there to do it? You could file it through one 800 wx brief or online at one 800 wx brief. Um there's other websites that you can do it on as well, um, but I could not tell you all of the other websites that, that you could do it on. No worries. Um, how do you open an IFR flight plan? So you could call tower, depending upon if you're at a towered field that, that, that does that uh, clearance delivery. Um, on a, the field that I fly out of, you need to call uh, a, a phone number. Atlanta Approach does that for you. Okay. Where'd you get that phone number from? Four flight. Okay. <laughs> four flight's got it all, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, what if I? What if a pilot didn't have four flight? This is a bonus bonus question. Where would I get that number if I didn't have four flight? Uh, the AFD would have that information on it. AFD, man, you've yeah. been in aviation for a long time, hadn't you? Uh, yeah. That's that's that's. We don't a, call that green book anymore. The AFD chart per, supplement. Chart supplement. That's what yes, it became yes. long many years ago. Yes. <laughs> but but guess who still calls it? Uh, AFD. Probably Russell still. The four flight. No, I'm, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that's good. Uh, no. Uh, um, yes, four flight actually does call it AFD now that I think they about do. it. They do. Actually, when you still yep. do call it that. Um, okay, so that is, some, that is some bona fide ways to be able to open a flight plan. What about closing it? Uh, so you can close it in the, in the sky with a person that you're currently speaking to, um, or you can call, again, the same people that you called to open it. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's kind of funny how the this VFRs open and close. So we reactivate an IFR flight plan. Yes. Yes. And a, a nicer language. It is, yeah. A yeah, yeah, nicer language. Um, let's see here. Uh, what You just told me how you did it, which is my next question, which is how do you receive an ATC clearance when you're at an airport without clearance delivery? And you just told me how to do that. So that works good. Um, I'd like to give you a clearance. Okay. And I'd like for you to read it back to me. Can I please? Um, actually, I tell you what. I'm going to give you. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to give you an end number. How about that? Okay. Okay. You ready? So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to give you a clearance, and you're going to read it back to me. Okay. Sounds good. Yes. Here we go. November one, two, three, four. You're cleared to the Craig Airport as filed. Upon departure, climb and maintain three thousand. Expect seven thousand in one zero minutes after departure. Departure frequency is 124.5, squawk 1763, and I'm at your airport, so I'm going to throw this on there. Void if not off by 1630, time now 1610. All right, so I am cleared to the Craig Airport uh, as filed. Climbing to maintain 3,000, expect 7,000, uh, one zero minutes after departure. Uh, frequency 124.5, squawking 1763. Uh, and 1610 is time now, void time 1630. Good deal. Okay, so that's good with the cross-country planning. Let's move on to the next thing because I do want to cover a couple more things. Um, we're ready to get out there and we're going to go to fly the plane. And uh, with the, the thing in aviation, it says unless the, unless the weight, the, the paper, uh, the weight of the paper exceeds the weight of the airplane, we're not ready to go flying. So we've got a lot of things we take with us. That digital thing there helps to reduce the paper weight. Um, on our big screen here behind us, 
Uh, let's pull up the airport diagram for our departure airport, and uh, let's look and see uh, a couple of things on there. So we'll look at these charts in sequence, ask you just a couple of questions of each chart as we're going along. This is Peachtree DeKalb Airport out of uh, Georgia. And uh, the first thing is we'll just talk about some very basic things. Um, there are some circles on there with the letters HS beside that. Tell me what those are. Those are hot spots. And what is that? Uh, uncommon to popular belief is not where the sun shines a little harder uh, on that part of the airport. Uh, it's actually where more accidents happen. So whether it's metal on metal, you know, a aircraft hitting each other or uh, mistaking a uh, taxiway for a runway, kind of just things that you need to be looking okay. out for. Now, I know that you're using ForeFlight. Do you have a Jeppesen subscription? I do not. You're using NACO? Yes. Or government charts. Okay. Is this chart current? This chart is current as of right now. When would it not be current? Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, tell the viewers how you know that. Um, on the left-hand side. Uh, and you got to turn your head like yes, this? Yes, juxtaposed okay. a little bit to the right. Very good. Right. A um, couple of things here I'm going to ask you about the chart here. Um, one of them is at the bottom of runway three right. Yes. So at the arrival end, there's uh, this little box there, and it has an arrow pointing to it, and it says EMAS. What's that? Uh, I do not know what EMAS is. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. No sense in hovering around that. Um, over on the right-hand side there, we can see that it says runway, or RWY, 03 left, 21 right. And then it has S20 underneath it, and it has another runway and some other stuff. What is the, uh, on the runway 3 left, 21 right, what does S20 mean? I do not know. Okay, well, let's go on uh, to the next thing. That won't be no issue at all there. Uh, let's actually see here. Oh, yeah, here's another one. Uh, down here at the bottom, it says January 2020, annual rate of change, zero degree west, and it has this little V thing with a variance on there. What is that? Uh, magnetic deviation. For what? For the airport or what? For this chart in itself. Okay. Uh, at the top left-hand corner here, it says ATIS-128-4, Peachtree Tower and a star. What's the star mean? That it has hours of operation. Okay, the tower has hours of operation. Very good. All right, so we'll, we're going to, just so we can kind of move through a little bit quicker, because there are some certain things I want to talk about, let's look at um, some of their low en route chart okay. as we're going to depart Peachtree to cab. Now, I do like to ask about a... Uh, uh, instrument departures, but uh, all it has is just bare takeoff minimums out of PDK. It doesn't actually have any departures, so we can't do with that. So here's our route right here, and um, we'll just kind of zoom in up on the PDK area, and we'll just kind of look at this. We'll have a couple of screens of this. I'll ask you about one or two questions from each one. Um, in the middle of this screen, there's a big blue shaded patch. What's that? Uh, a Bravo. A Class Bravo. Yes. Around that class Bravo, there's this green dashed, heavy dash line that forms a square around that Bravo. What's that? I do not know what that green square is. Okay. We'll cover this in your debrief. Okay. But we're just going to keep going because I do want to get on, uh, cover a couple more things here yes, before sir. we do. All right, let's look at the far right-hand corner over there. There's a couple of numbers that's written in gray. Four to the second power, or however you want to say it, four to the seventh power, four to six. What are those numbers? That is the Aroka. What is that? So when you're, there's airways, um, but when you're not off an arrow, when you're off route, um, there's a certain uh, elevation that you need to stay at to make sure that you're not going to crash into anything or stay 1,000 to 2,000 feet above uh, the nearest object. So how much clearance is that 4,200 giving me? A thousand above the tallest, uh, object. Now, a minute ago, you said a thousand to 2,000. When would it be two? In mountainous terrain. Okay. I like that answer. Um, I see that there's some 
routes around here, like some Victor Airways. Yes, sir. Some of them are blue and some of them are black. What's that about? So some of them are uh, using ground-based navigational aids and others are using a GPS. Can you use the black ones? I can, yes. Can you use the blue ones? Yes. Okay. Let's go to the next chart here that we have, next section of the chart. A uh, couple of things on here. Uh, there's another little lighter shader blue over there, smaller one. What's that one? That's a Class Charlie right there. That's a Class Charlie. Um, are there any other airspaces that are depicted on this chart? There's MOAs on this chart. Um, I'm not sure if that's kind of what you're what you're talking. Uh, just regular airspace, not special use. Okay. Um, so there is none. Just Bravo Charlie and. Uh, yeah, the Echo uh, okay. and the G Golf. What are all the green airports? Those are all uh, airports with instrument approaches. Okay. Let's uh, zoom in on the next page or just go to the next page. And I think there's a close-up picture of some routes here. Um, let's see if I can find one on here. I guess I'm not going to be able to find a brown airport on here, am I? Probably not. Okay, let's go back to the previous page and we'll just pick up from where we have there. Um, so let's look at uh, some of these some of these things here. I'm just going to get up here so I can point. What's this thing here? That is a VOR. A VOR. All right. And uh, let's look at, uh, there's this, maybe hard to see, but you see that green line right there? Yes. That, that, Particular line right there. What's that line there? That's the magnetic uh, different deviation in, in uh, the difference in your magnetic and true north. Okay. And what's that word called one more time? Magnetic deviation. Maybe variation. Maybe variation <laughs> would probably be the more correct term. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let's look at some, um, some, do we have a, let's go to the next one. I want to see if I get a little bit more close up a view of the, of the airways. So we're looking at here, uh, let's look at this airway here. So we've got some numbers here above the airway. So what, are that, what is that number and that number and that number and that number? So the top, the 3000, that is uh, your MEA, your minimum in route in route, in route altitude. Okay. Uh, 441 is the number of, is the name of it, um, or the number associated to that uh, airway. 95 is the uh, length of the airway. Um, and then 18, I can't tell you what the 18 is. Okay. Um, what is this? Triangle. It's like an in intersection. An intersection? Yes. Okay. Um, with, is this a, for, as far as the intersection goes, is, or this, uh, this point, is this compulsory or non-compulsory? That one is non-compulsory. Non-compulsory. All right. Very good. Uh, there's a little 46 inside that funky looking figure there. What's that? 46 miles if you're going that way. There's this 46 mile length if you're, if you're going for, from the last one if you're going that way. Okay, outstanding. Um, up in the upper right hand corner there it says uh, P 50. What's that? A prohibited area. Can you fly on that? You cannot. It's prohibited. Okay. <laughs> right there in its name, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, over here on this airway here, there's a little gray holding pattern. What's the purpose of that being listed there? Uh, it's just a published hold. So. Um, that's kind of where uh, HTC could send you if they said, hey, hold at lips uh, on, the, on the publish hold. At, I'm assuming that's how you say that. Okay. Um, and you would just, it kind of shows you that it's left turns and it's, you know. Okay. I'm sorry, um, right turns. Yeah, last thing here. Um, read me from 22.2 all the way down to the bottom. Read me that VOR box. Okay, 122. Oh, man. 122.2 is the. FSS for that VOR. Um, Craig is the name. And then there's two H's. 114.5 is the frequency. Uh, CRG 92 is the uh, 
code for the VOR, and then that more the, the line dot line dot. That's the Morse code that you would listen that you would ID when you uh, tune into the VOR, and then you have the um, sorry, the coordinates. And then Gainesville is the the, the flight service. Okay. Um, one more time, if you could explain to me, after the Craig, there's two H's in parentheses. What are those two H's? I do not know what those okay. two H's are. No worries. We'll come back to those in the debrief. Okay. Um, you are flying along. And um, so we're going to go now to a, a different section, but you're going to have to figure out what I'm talking about here just by way of the scenario, okay? All right. Um, so you're flying along, and uh, you realize... Ain't hurt anybody in a long time. Mm. So you squeeze down the trigger of the PTT and you go, y'all still there? And nothing. You check your static, your squelch. You go to activate the squelch. It's dead silence. Volume, nothing. What has probably happened? Uh, communication failure. Okay. So you know the question I'm going to ask you. Walk me through. Um, you're almost to Craig. You're only about 50 miles out from Craig, okay? It's hard IFR all the way there, but you don't have any radios for some reason. Walk me through what you would do in this particular instance. Uh, take a deep breath would be the first thing I would do. Um, so obviously I've tried to troubleshoot my radio. Um, for a, uh, I know that this is not going to suffice for this uh, check ride, um, but I have a handheld that I carry with me just in case because I, I want to make sure that um, if the radios in my aircraft were ever to go down, I, I at least have uh, a handheld that could be used as a backup. Um, so that's what I would use. Um, but I'm just going to assume that in this check ride, the my batteries have died. <laughs> um, so I would. <clears throat> First, try not to freak out, continue flying uh, the aircraft. Um, as they say, aviate, navigate, communicate. So if I can't communicate, at least I can still aviate and navigate. Um, so I would keep uh, the altitude that I'm at, um, and I would go for the highest altitude um, of these three altitudes, uh, which was the altitude that I was assigned, um, the uh, MEA, the minimum in route altitude, or uh, the expected altitude. Those would be, I would go for the highest of those altitudes. Okay. And then uh, my route, I would stay on my assigned route. Um, if not, uh, I would go for uh, the vectored route that I was in, or that I was being, that I was, uh, the, the route that I was being vectored for. Um, the uh, expected route as well, and then if not, then the filed route. Okay. What is a leave clearance limit? A leave clearance limit. Couldn't give you a good answer for that. Where were you cleared to in that clearance I gave you a minute ago? Craig, the Craig Airport. That's as far as I could go. Okay. All right. So what would happen? Let's bring back in the time thing. Okay. What would happen if you got to your destination early? No comms. That would be, that could cause an issue because they are, they're not expecting me to uh, be there at the time, so they have not cleared that area for me at that time. That could cause an issue. Okay. What happens if you get there on time? That would be good. What would you do? In what sense, so it, where have I arrived on time? Um, at your leave clearance limit. So I've arrived at Craig. Well, sort of. Of course, you, hopefully you didn't land at Craig. Okay. But so, you're only, you, you're, you're on time, so what would you do if you were on time? So there's three different po possibilities here. Okay. You're either late, you're on time, you're or you're early. So there's couple of overlaps there, but um, whichever one you like to try to explain first. So I'm in IFR. I'm I in, I am in IMC, obviously. IMC. Yeah. Um, so I would uh, try and make it, obviously, as, as, as on time as possible. I would go to a the, the beginning of uh, an approach fix, and, and then, but the, I would go to an initial approach fix and try to fly 
the approach and land. Which approach would you choose? How would you choose the approach, I should say? That's a solid question. Um, I would go with the forecasted weather, the last thing that I was, that I was told, or if um, there was a, you know, if I, when I checked the NOTAMs, none of the runways were closed or none of the air approaches were, were uh, there was an issue with any of the approaches. Um, I would go either with a forecasted weather or I'd kind of look for, well, no, I'm an IMC, so yeah, the forecasted weather. Does your GPS have ADSB? It does. Okay. So somebody's landing, if, they, if everybody's using, for example, runway one, then I could, you know, land on, run, I, would, I would go for the approach on runway one. Okay. And so when would you leave this hold that you were holding at now? At five, you're at 5,000 feet and you're just holding over this spot. When would you leave it? So if I was given an EFC, uh, at an EFC, or at the EFC, uh, estimate further clearance time. And if not, I would try to uh, arrive at my airport as, as close to the ETA as possible. Okay. So early you'd hold. Uh, what if you're on time or late? If I was on time, I would proceed with the approach. And then if I was late, I would do the same thing, I guess, because I would I'm gonna end up running out of fuel eventually if I just sit okay. there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so definitely there's much more uh, that we could delve into. We're time limited tonight, and we're basically at the end of our time. Um, I will give you just a little pointer at the very end of that. We'll leave it on this, on this point here before we call it out. Um, always file to a point, you know, have, instead of filing direct or something like that, always file to a, a part of an approach that already has a hold on it. Make okay. that your final point before you actually get in. If anything does happen or if you lose comms, you're, you already are there. Your GPS is already showing it. It's a predetermined spot. And you don't have to think about, do I just go over Craig at 5,000 feet and hold at 5,000 feet over Craig? And that would be the most correct answer. Okay. Um, but you, go, you can also go to a point on a fixed one, uh, a point on which a approach begins. But then you have to figure out, like, hey, which one? And how come? And yes. why? And how long? And you get too many things to have to think about, right? So if you have this predetermined point prior to, you don't have to think about where you're going to go when you get there because you've already thought all about it before you get there. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Alex, like thank that. you so much for joining us tonight. Um, the folks at home, this has been uh, a very uh, great experience here working with Alex. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call it quits tonight. This has been a wonderful experience. Like I said, we're going to turn it back over to Russ, and Russ is going to play us out. Well, Todd, Alex looked like he did pretty good. He seemed comfortable. How do you know his stuff? How, how do you do? You know, he actually did quite well. Uh, he's, he's still preparing. Uh, there are a couple of things that he could definitely tighten up on and that he's going to do better. I did provide with him uh, to him a thorough debriefing after the, the point today. So I think he's going to be very ready for a check ride when the time comes. Although we didn't get a chance to go all the way through uh, to the end of the ride, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, I was somewhat impressed with the, uh, <laughs> I said somewhat impressed. I was impressed with what his knowledge was in regards to that. I apologize for that. But here's some things that I think a lot of people, when they're preparing for the instrument check ride, probably some is very important for them to know. One of them is why do we actually, uh, why do we train so hard on the instrument rating? Well, it's because uh, we always have to plan for a loss of calm. So if you're uh, completely in the clouds and you are not always planning for a loss of calm, you're not planning for the correct way to actually prepare for your instrument. So always be thinking, what do I do if I am not talking to ATC? How do I get there? What do I do? Altitudes. Everything that we do in instruments basically ri uh, lies around what we have to do, uh, what we should do for the loss of calm. Yeah, be um, predictable. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. It's all uh, it's a, it's a ballet. It's very choreographed. There's no there's not a lot of things that are that are punches to be pulled. Uh, we we train on systems failures. We train on every type of thing. So it should be what just business as usual. If anything should happen during that thing, um, and then the second thing is think it through. Whatever you're trying to do, just think it through. I ask a lot of uh, scenarios that causes the pilot to actually try to think it through. 
And a lot of them don't have that. They have a lot of Q&A uh, prep that goes into it, uh, what we refer to as rote memorization for the questions. Um, what, what three uh, items are in the system? It's one, two, three. All right, how does that work? Mm, not sure. Okay, well, that doesn't really help me that you know what the things are called, but you don't know how they work. And if they should go bad, what does it look like when they're bad? So thinking it through, thinking about loss of comms, that'll really set someone up right for it for an instrument check ride. Okay, sounds good. I like seeing his confidence in the fact that he was never at a loss for words. Right, absolutely. So it's nice to see somebody who's comfortable in the seat. Yep. Okay, well, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Alex did a great job. If you have an instrument uh, rating in your future, please come visit us at groundschool.com. We've got a great instrument program. So again, thanks for joining us, and so long.